All right, Alexander, let's do an update on Ukraine and uh, the big the big story in Ukraine is, of course, Bakhmut. So let's just jump into it because it looks like we are in a situation where Bakhmut is, uh, is encircled or the Russian uh, military Wagner, to be honest. Wagner Group is maybe 500 meters, 1,000 meters away from cutting off the final road. And and uh, Alensky is sending more more, more uh, resources into Bakhmut, as according to CNN, which, okay. What, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I think you're absolutely right about the first. I think we really are actually now in, an, in a situation of effective encirclement. I mean, I saw a report yesterday. I think you probably saw it as well that there's an NGO, a Ukrainian NGO, which has been tasked with getting people out of Bakhmut, civilians, and they stop doing it because they say that the Russians can now launch anti-tank guided missiles at vehicles that travel up and down these roads. So that brings, that confirms that the Russians are almost up to the roads themselves because, you know, anti-tank guided missiles do not have very long range, I mean, of one, two kilometers maybe, but even that's probably on the outside. They have to, they, they operate within visual range of the operator. So the Russians are in a position where they're actually able to see directly what goes on on the roads. And of course, these are precision guided um, weapons. If they're used properly, then, you know, if they target something like a truck, then that truck will be destroyed. So, you know, the roads are essentially closed. And as you absolutely rightly say, um, you, Zelensky himself, his leaders, his military chiefs, Zeluzhny and General Sirsky, who is the commander of the ground forces, they seem to be determined still to go on fighting. And you're absolutely right. I'm hearing reports that... They're sending more troops to Brahmut, even as more and more Ukrainian soldiers apparently are protesting now about the illogic of doing this. There was a report, which is perhaps a bit difficult to confirm, that some Ukrainian volunteers are protesting against it. And there's also another report, which is confirmed as far as I'm concerned, which you saw a Ukrainian officer speaking on on some sort of video channel in which he said that Ukraine is losing two companies of troops in Bakhmut a day, a, ba a battalion each week. That's, you know, about 600 men. And he said, I don't understand the logic of doing this. And of course, nor do we. But nonetheless, Zelensky, Zeluzhny, Sirsky continue to do this. They continue to ship more men, more machines, more troops to the meat grinder in Bakhmut. And Prigozhin, who is the titular head of the Wagner Group, he's just published this defiant statement in which he says to Zelensky, please don't retreat from Bakhmut. Stay where, keep your troops there. Send more of them. Um, don't act like a coward by retreating. And of course, what Prigozhin is doing is he's goading Zelensky to try to get him to do exactly what Zelensky seems to want to do, which is to send more and more of his troops into Bakhmut, where they get killed. And I, I have to say, it's a very strange battle in that respect. Um, one gets the sense that within Ukraine itself, within some levels of Ukraine's government, there's now growing doubts about the wisdom of this. But the leadership, Ukraine's leadership, Zelensky, Zeluzhny, Sirsky, they seem to be committed to this policy. So the, the policy of, of continuing to, to send more resources into Bakhmut is something we discussed in, in a video we did a couple of days ago. But, but we return to it again because... You you have a a situation where the the city is is effectively uh, surrounded and uh, it's lost 
But the, the leadership in Ukraine continues to pour uh, men and resources into that area, into that front line, and they get annihilated uh, by the Russians. So we come back to, to, to the same question that we explored last video. Why? And the, the, only, the only things that I can think of is they're trying to buy time and Alensky and Zeluzhny, they've been ordered, most likely by NATO, to, to send whatever resources you have to Bakhmut because we need more time. We need you to buy as much time as possible in order for us to do something, um, to prepare forces that we're training, to prepare something in the West, to, to uh, isolate Russia more on a diplomatic level, to, um, to, to wait Russia out because they're running out of weapons. I don't know. Uh, something along those lines. Uh, otherwise, none of this makes any sense whatsoever. Or, or the, other, the other reason that this is being done is, is because they don't want the, the PR media defeat. I mean, I can see that in a way because it was just a month and a half ago that uh, that Alensky was was presenting Congress with a flag from the fighters of Bakhmut. And give me one second, Alexander. I think I even have the quotes for for you. I think I saved the quote of what he told Congress during that speech. He said, "The fight for Bakhmut will change the trajectory of our war for independence and freedom." That's what he said to, to Congress as he was handing them, you know, the flag with all the signatures. I mean, I, I, I don't want to repeat the video we did last no. week, but why? No, why are I, they doing I, this? Especially now that you are getting reports of some sort of mutiny. And, yes. and I would say that those reports are hard to confirm, but it wouldn't surprise me. No, it wouldn't. They're, they're entirely plausible. And frankly, I have to say this, I hope it's going, I, I hope it's actually happening. And the reason I'm hoping it's happening is not because I want Ukraine to lose Bakhmut. I mean, that's another issue. It's because, frankly, if these soldiers are mutinying, then there's a chance that lives might be saved. Because all that's being done at the moment is that lives are being lost and lost to no good purpose. But why are they doing it? Well, we discussed it, as you said, at length in that previous video. We talked about the tactical importance of Bakhmut, the fact that it's the hub of the, of the communications, the fact that it's basically the lock that will open the door for Russia to capture the rest of Donbass, all of those things. But you're, you're perfectly correct. This has gone beyond anything like that now. I think maybe there is a rationalisation, you know, that we're fighting to gain time, that, you know, the more uh, time we get, the more uh, forces we build up, the more we learn to use these Bradleys and Marders and Leopards and all that sort of thing. I don't think even people in the West believe that anymore. I remember when there was the Severodonetsk Lizzie Chance fighting, that um, at that time, the story, you know, that Ukraine was playing for time, sacrificing thousands of lives to buy time for its offensives in the autumn. That, that a lot of journalists believed that and reported it. I've noticed that this time they're not doing that. And bear in mind, Bakhmut, by some estimates, is the single biggest battle of the 21st century. I mean, it's involved more troops um, than any other battle that's been fought this century up to now. It's bigger than Aleppo, bigger than Mosul, bigger than, you know, any of the other battles that have been fought in the Middle East. So it's a big battle. So it's not buying Ukraine time, it's weakening Ukraine. It's losing more and more men, more and more machines. They're even to some extent apparently starting to use Western equipment that was supposed to be intended for the counteroffensive. They're starting to use it in Bakhmut to try to hold on to Bakhmut. They're using up shells, including apparently dud shells that they got from the Middle East, which are more dangerous sometimes to the Ukrainians who try to fire them than to the Russians. So they're losing, up, using, losing resources fighting in Bakhmut faster than they can build them up for these offensives. And I think this is now actually fairly widely understood. I think 
increasingly that it is 90% optics. And just look at what Ukraine has done over the last, well, shall we say 60 hours. We had a drone attack on an airbase in Belarus, which was supposed to target a Russian AWACS aircraft there. And we got all kinds of excited reports, including an entire bulletin from the British Ministry of Defence, acting as if this aircraft had been either seriously damaged and destroyed or, or destroyed. And in fact, it wasn't, it wasn't apparently even touched. But anyway, we had the drone attack there. We had a big drone attack across Russia. You know, lots of different drones being launched in different directions. None of them apparently reached or hit its target. We had another drone attack, another big drone attack, 10 drones launched against Crimea. And again, none of them apparently hit their target. And now we have the news this morning of a Ukrainian incursion into Bryansk region, targeting two villages. Very difficult to see what exactly uh, that's intended to achieve milit militarily. But, you know, it's a developing story. We don't know the full extent of what's happened. It doesn't seem as if many... Ukrainian troops were involved, perhaps 40, some say as many as 80, who knows. But, you know, it does seem as if at least one man has been killed, a civilian, a, a, a young woman, a, a girl, a child was injured. Uh, um, and there's talk that hostages have been taken. It's, it, it, it all looks like Ukraine doing these things and holding on to Bakhmut more with the appearance of trying to show that it's still in the game, that it's still fighting, maybe running out of ammunition, it may be running out of men, it may be um, seeing its prospects in this offensive come up for increasing doubts by more and more people, but they can't face and own up to the fact that they're losing on every front. So they come up with these little pinprick attacks, which will simply infuriate the Russians even more, harden Russian opinion in Russia, and they cling on to Bakhmut literally like grim death. Right, just, just so I understand what you're saying, because I think it makes sense. Um, they, they, they cling on to Bakhmut because they can't have... Uh, the the collective West, specifically the the uh, the Europeans, I think more than more than the Americans, the, the American partners, the the European member states, they can't have them seeing Ukraine losing because they're going to start to to pull out of the this this coalition of of countries that is that is uh, supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes, right? So they want to make sure that everyone is still invested in Project Ukraine, so they don't want to lose Bakhmut. So they want to hold on to it for as long as uh, possible, while at the same time, they're conducting all of these these drone strikes and terrorist attacks to to try and keep morale up, to show that they're doing something, that they're hitting Russia in one way or another, or that they're making progress in one way or another, or... Or just basically even distracting away from from Bakhmut, so the media can report on on, on on a great Ukraine drone strike in Minsk, and look at that, we're hitting Belarus, or we're hitting areas close to Moscow. Look at look at the progress we're making. Look at look at how 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 much of on the attack we are. So so it even could act as a distraction from Bakhmut in in a way. I mean. This is, and all of this is done in order to not only not not only so much to buy time, but to buy time in order to keep everyone invested in Project Ukraine, in order to get more money and more weapons, which just may make a difference six months down the line or a year down the line. I mean. This may be their their type of type of thinking, if I'm understanding you correct. I mean, yeah, it I makes think, sense that this is what they're trying yes. to do. Yes. yes. How do we get it's more sense. more money and more weapons? Yes. yes. Well, we have I, to do all of these things in order to to get more money and more weapons, and we got to keep everyone united. 
Yeah, I mean, essentially, this is what they did um, during and after the, the uh, uh, Lugansk battles, the battles in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Mariupol last, last summer. Again, you know, lots of talk about Ukrainian offensive in her Son region. Lots of pinprick attacks on the Russians. I mean, that was when they started drone attacks and helicopter raids and into, you know, Russian, into Belgorod and Bryansk and those sort of places. Um, shelling of Donetsk City. That, by the way, has eased off. Um, probably a sign that Ukraine is running low on ammunition, by the way. And keeping everybody, you know, in in suspense and thinking that this, you know, a war that was going Ukraine's way. And it worked. I mean, up to a point in the summer, it worked. And, of course, we did get the offensives, the counter-offensives in the autumn, and they did regain ground. But they didn't, in the end, achieve any of the objectives that Ukraine and its leaders uh, and the leaders of the West were expecting. And I think this time, and this is an important thing, this time, hearing this whole thing Hearing this, this same story, seeing the same story being run out, run out again, seeing the same film, if you like, being shown all over again with slightly different you know, towns and characters, there's a lot more cynicism. I mean, there was a most interesting article in The Spectator. Now, The Spectator is a British, newspaper, a British magazine, news magazine. In fact, it's Britain's leading news magazine. It's aligned with the Conservative Party. And its editor, for many years, was none other than Boris Johnson. <laughs> OK, so, I mean, it's very much in his camp. And it's written a most extraordinarily pessimistic article now about the war in Ukraine. Its title is, Is Putin Winning? Question mark. And when you read it, it basically says, yes, he is. So, I mean, so you see, you, you, get, you get a much more cynicism and gloom in the West than you were at the time of the Severodonetsk, Lizzie Chance battles back in the summer. But that doesn't prevent Ukraine trying to repeat the script. Okay, uh, final question to, to just broaden it out a little bit, but s staying in line with this thinking that they're trying to buy time. They've been ordered by NATO, by, by the U.S., by the Biden White House to buy time. So just keep on pouring resources and, and, and people into, into the front line of Bakhmut to buy time. Do you think that one of the, the, the expectations of the, the Alensky regime is that the more time that, uh, that the Alensky regime can buy, the more of an opportunity it gives for the European Union and the United States to produce ammo that they're running out of. Because I've been reading a lot of reports coming out of, of the EU and the US that they are trying to find ways to ramp up the, uh, the production of ammo, while I'm also reading reports like what you're reading, which is saying that Ukraine is really running out of ammo. I mean, they're starting to ration the ammunition, the ammunition that they're giving to, uh, to their forces. I mean, I'm reading a lot of reports saying that they're, they're rationing everything out now. So is this perhaps, uh, you know, buy time while we ramp up production of ammo and get it to you? So just, you know, and I say that because you get a lot of articles which say, well, the Russians are using human wave tactics. And the minute I read articles like that, I say, well, let's just reverse that because everything the collective West media writes is, is just reversed. And I say, okay, so it's Ukraine that is using human wave tactics. Why are they using human wave tactics? Why are they sending people into Bakhmut? They want to buy time. And then I'm getting reports of EU and the US. They're, they're, they're trying to churn out ammo as quickly as possible. I mean, is, is, that, is that what they're holding out for? Well, I think that, you know, people who are in this situation, this kind of situation, will cling on to any straw. And it may very well be that they're saying to themselves, let's cling on in Bakhmut, let's go on for another couple of weeks, and, you know, maybe at that point the ammunition problems will be solved. Now, I, I'm going to say straight away, I, I actually had a conversation some time ago 
with somebody who worked in an art, in a, a factory that meant made shells in Hungary <laughs> during the Cold War. This person was a production line worker, by the way, and it was a woman. <laughs> and <laughs> what she told me. The way she described it is that this is far from being a straightforward process. I mean, it may sound like it is, but you you need a very trained workforce, a very highly trained workforce, and a large workforce to do this well, because you need to know how much explosive to put in the shells. The shells need to be the casing of the shells needs to be correct. It needs to be, uh, um, pro you know, properly adapted to particular calibers and to particular types of artillery tubes. Anyway, I'm not going to pretend that I understood this, but everybody who is an expert in this says the same thing. Yes, over time, if you invest enough, you will produce more shells. But in order to make a significant difference on the Ukrainian battlefields, you're not going to be able to do it in anything like the kind of time frame that Ukraine needs. You certainly won't get the shell shortage for Ukraine sorted by the summer. Now, well, you could do, but you'd need to mobilise the European economies and the American economies, put them essentially on a war footing. I mean, it, it's, it's not possible to do it whilst we run the, our civilian economies in the way that we are. So it, it's not going to solve the problem. But I can easily believe that this is what people in Kiev, and perhaps in London and Brussels and Washington, are saying to each other, let's hold on a little longer, we'll sort out this problem with the shells, we'll make more shells. At the moment, by the way, the target is to produce, as I understand it, 90,000 rounds of, our, of uh, uh, artillery rounds a month bring up production, and as I said, some say this was going to take at least two or three years to achieve, two years I've heard, but 90,000 rounds of artillery shells is what Ukraine is currently, or at least was using um, over the last couple of weeks. That's about 3,000 rounds of shells a day. Russia uses about 20,000 rounds of shells a day. So, even that would still, even if that was achieved, it would still leave Ukraine at a colossal disadvantage. So, you know, that's, but that, I can, I can believe that that is the thinking. I can imagine that that's the kind of thinking that some people are in Kiev are engaging in. But as I said, if, if so, then they're deluding themselves and they're deluding the Ukrainian people because... It's not going to happen on anything like the kind of scale that they need it, they need it to happen in order to win. Yeah, but that would explain to me that that explains the, the, the panic over China as well. And this is probably for, for a separate video, but just r real quick, you know, the, the panic of China, the fact that the collective West is panicking over China providing uh, weapons to Russia, ammunition to Russia means that there are decision makers in the collective West that that believe that Russia is running out of ammo. We're getting back to the Russia is running out of weapons narrative, but I think there are people in the collective West that do believe that Russia is running out of weapons and they're and they're doing everything in their power to try to 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 uh, to, to strangle Russia from any opportunity of getting weapon supplies because they feel that they can that they can wait Russia out, so they have to cut off the Chinese. They, you know, Blinken has to travel to to all these countries and send warnings, and tell this country not to supply weapons, and tell that country not to supply weapons, or else. And they're ramping up the rhetoric with China. I, I mean, it, it all leads to, in my opinion, to to decision makers in the collective West, not all of them, but some of them who actually believe that. If we can ramp up our ammo production and Russia must be running out of weapons, well, then we can eventually, over time, we can eventually um, 
bring this war to to some sort of a, of a stalemate, which for Ukraine would be a type of victory. Yeah, I think that is very much the thinking. The trouble is, of course, that there's no evidence that the Russians are running out of shells or missiles or any of these things. Every couple of weeks we hear these reports, and I just read another report. Well, there is, recently. can I interrupt? Yeah, go on. I mean, I, I just want to say one thing. I mean, I, I think I think the evidence is is what you said in your previous statement, which is the evidence is how could the Russians be producing so much when they're a gas station masquerading as a country? I mean, you know, you said it yourself. Russia's producing how much did you say? 20, 20,000 a 20, day? Well, they're, they're launching 20,000 rounds of ammunition 20, a day. Yeah. Were, yeah I mean, were, if you're were, sitting were, in Washington, you're probably saying, I mean, if you're Newland, you're probably saying it's impossible that Russia can keep yes. this going yeah. at, that, at this That's, level when we're only able to produce X amount. Yes. I think that is exact. I, I think you've put your finger on it. I think that's exactly what it is. Can I just say something? I mean, yeah, there were there were some reports a couple of week about two three weeks ago that there'd been some kind of reduction in Russian artillery use. Um, you know, the, the, the number of rounds that the Russians had been firing had declined. Um, I, I, I've seen some reports now, and that's those reports were wrong. So the Russians on an on a normal day launch fire something like twenty thousand rounds of artillery in Ukraine in the Ukraine war. Ukraine f- was firing around six thousand rounds a day a few weeks ago. It's now apparently on an average day fallen to around three. <laughs> and it's th- th- this is I, I think you put your finger on it. People like Newland. People like Blinken, people like Sullivan, people like uh, William Burns, the CIA director, you know, because he's agency, it's the agency that's been providing all the data that all the, in, all the decisions have been based on. They cannot believe that the Russians are able to keep up this level of production and this level of output. It, is, it, 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 it goes fundamentally against... So, so fundamentally against their own understanding, their own belief system about the kind of country and society and economy that Russia is, that they, they can't quite imagine that this is true. In fact, they can't imagine that this is true. So, you know, they're saying this is a bluff. The Russians are running through their stockpiles faster even than we are. Uh, they can't sustain this for much longer. If we find some way of choking off semiconductors and all that, we're going to find ourselves in a position of choking the Russians off. The budget, the, the Russian budget was in deficit in January. By the way, some indications are it's improved significantly in February, but we don't have the figures, so I'm not going to guess about that. But, you know, the budget was in deficit in January. It's all about to collapse like a house of cards. All we need to do is just keep going, send a few more tanks, send a few more uh, uh, drones or whatever it is we're going to send. And believe me, trust me, I know what I'm saying. It's all going to come right. And of course, it doesn't come right. But, you know, that doesn't stop them saying that. And um, I suspect that ultimately, much more than hope about increasing production of shells. I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, but I haven't actually seen much action, any practical action being taken about it. And I understand it's very difficult to. As I said, I should say that this person who worked as a production line worker, by the way, said to me, this is skilled. This is not, you know, completely unskilled work. The problem is you need trained people to do that. You need people who have an understanding of how to work with explosives, for example. <laughs> things of that kind and you know chemicals and all, all, all the things that are there this is not straightforward that is the major problem and training up people to that level takes time and increasing the factory spaces takes time too and building the machine tools and sorting out the organization this is anyway it's not practical to do it within a few months but they say if we can't do it it's not possible it's just not possible that the Russians can. Before we, before we 
switch, you know, finish. Well, you know, we're talking about shells and Ukraine going through a shell shortage. There's a very, very interesting article in the London Times, which also suggested to me very strongly that Ukraine is also now actually running out of men. Now, we've all been seeing all these pictures of people being rounded up in the streets and press ganged into the Ukrainian army, and it's all very harrowing to watch and suggestive about it, but we can't give a statistical view based on these impressions. But this article in the London Times, which for the first time addressed the question of Ukrainian casualties, it actually gave away something else, which is that it basically said that the Ukrainian army today numbers 200,000 men. In other words, it's much smaller than it was in the summer. The losses it's experienced have eaten away at its manpower reserves. Now, that was the, that's the other big difference, you see, from the summer, because in the summer, Ukraine was... The Ukrainian military was expanding rapidly because there'd been these repeated mobilizations. And it grew at one point to apparently something like 700,000 men in uniform. Now, that wasn't... <laughs> Not all of those men were fighters. Not all of those men were able to be deployed on the battlefields. Perhaps only a fraction of those could. But nonetheless, the Ukraine did have a numerical advantage by the end of the summer and into the autumn. That, it seems, has been irrecoverably lost. And, you know, you can... Perhaps over time, in a year, two years, come up with more artillery shells. But you can't come up with more Ukrainian men. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll end it there, I guess. Well, one quick question. Do, do you uh, believe that Russia is, uh, is able to produce all those, uh, all those weapons at, at the pace they're, they're producing them? Yes. I mean, I have said this, I mean, the first thing to say is, I mean, you know, um, you hear all of these people who've been talking about the Russian economy. I've been talking about the Russian economy for years. Now, you know, I don't like to say this. This is a little bit, shall we say, you know, boastful a little. But who has been more consistently right about the Russian economy? All those people who told you it was a gas station. Or myself. And us, because you've lived there. I've been to Russian factories. I've seen the, how they work. I've seen the extent to which in Russia technical knowledge is extremely widespread. How in Russia, you know, vocational schools are still very popular. Um, how people, you know, you have available always a big pool of trained, skilled workers that you can rapidly deploy to these factories and get these factories producing shells at the kind of level that we've seen. And, of course, the Russians have something else, which is that they have a political and economic system which is geared to responding very quickly to an instruction of this nature. So you don't have this very complicated process of decision making and have to agree contracts to all of this kind of thing. You have Putin and his people meet in the Kremlin. They say we need more shells. The order gets passed down and the shells are made. And it's it's different from the way it was in the West. But it's, if you like, in the genetic code of Russian industrialization. It does mean that, you know, at times of peace, you have these giant factories which are underproducing, producing far below capacity, which to a Western mind is inefficient. But that's how Russia works. All right. Uh, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rockfin as well. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.